Welcome webinar attendees. My name is Frank Cordero, and I'm the Associate Program Director for CG Master Academy. Today's webinar is going to be an exciting one indeed. So guys, um, definitely uh, your host for this webinar, for this free training. Uh, I'm Frank Cordero, and for those who don't know me, I'm a former 2D cleanup animator during Disney's animation renaissance in 2D. Uh, I worked on films like Mulan, Lilo and Stitch, Brother Bear, uh, just to name a few. Um, I also uh, worked as a concept artist and associate art director in video games for EA Tiburon on titles like NASCAR, Madden Football, Tiger Woods PGA Golf. I'm a, currently a 3D modeler and instructor at Fulton College and also currently associate program director for CGMA. And I'm going to introduce Jason Martinson, and I'll let him tell you a little bit more about his awesome background. Hey guys, I'm Jason. I'm happy to be here. Um, my career started in 2002. Um, I worked at Naughty Dog, which is one of the premier video game studios in the world, on um, the Jack and Daxter uh, series, and then Uncharted. Uh, my first feature film was Ice Age 2, The Meltdown, and I worked at Blue Sky for quite a few years, and then ended up going uh, traveling around the world. I worked in Spain, uh, I worked at Sony, I've worked in London at VFX films like Iron Man 2 and Paul. And uh, recently, I have been at Real Effects for uh, Scooby-Doo and Rumble, and I am currently working on a new project there. That's awesome. Excellent, man. Well, so glad to have you on this. Uh, today's webinar is going to be sponsored by CGMA Animation Master Academy. CG Master Academy is the leader in online digital arts education in film, games, and now animation. Uh, we're thankful for the generous sponsorship. Uh, the Animation Master Academy is a next-level animation education experience and taught by some of the best and brightest animation instructors from all around the world. And it's an, an exciting new online program that's affordable, accessible, and industry-relevant for today's students. All right. So this webinar, if you are a student who's just starting out, um, don't have a portfolio, if you've struggled to find a job and or dissatisfied with the previous education that you had, well, guys, this webinar is definitely for you. So we're glad that you're here. You know, stand by for some great information. So what we're going to be covering today is a brief history of animation. Uh, and we say our history because a lot of it is more not just history, but also inspiration. So we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to it. We're also going to talk a little bit about the how the animation industry works today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about animation job types in the industry, in games, visual effects, TV, and also feature animation. We're also going to talk about how to become an animator and how to make a good demo reel. And Jason will definitely get into some of that. Um, and um, also talk a little bit about the skills required uh, to become an animator and how to um, master them over time. All right. So uh, let's start out by talking about our brief history of animation. And, you know, we wanted to set the stage a little bit uh, because it's really the, uh, the inspiration that moved us in the direction of being in this industry. Um, when I was a kid, I saw things that got me excited about being involved with animation. And when Jason was younger, he also had his favorites. So we get a chance to talk a little bit about that inspiration. And for you, that inspiration might be the same or it might be something different or maybe even something you've never even checked out before. So hopefully this will open you up to doing a little research and investigation about our amazing and rich animation history of the past. All right, so let's talk a little bit about 2D animation. Um, first and foremost, um, there's animation has been around a little bit longer than this, but Gertie the Dinosaur in particular, um, was uh, definitely one of the first uh, hand-drawn animated short. It was done by one person. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's pretty much the thing. I mean, there's very few people who could say, I hand-drew an entire short myself um, with the technology that they had of the time, which was practically not much but then just uh, filming uh, drawings through a camera. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's uh, take a look at some other inspiration. Well, for one thing, uh, everyone pretty much knows about Snow White. And if you don't, you need to if you're a student of animation. Uh, this is the first feature animated film. Um, and 
you know, on a lot of levels, it just works from storytelling and, you know, quality of the animation. Freddie Moore has got, you know, his fingers all over this, especially with the dwarves. And um, I mean, it still can move people to tears. I don't know how you feel about Snow White, but definitely it's on my mm-hmm. list of inspiration for a lot mm-hmm. of reasons. Yeah, um, it was one of the first ones that I think made you believe the characters were real and you stopped thinking of them as drawings and they, they were people or yep. dwarves or whatever you might say. <laughs> they, they were believable, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, they were. They, that was one of the first times and it was magic at the time. And if and if Disney could make you like kind of feel lovable and cry, well, to that degree, you have the opposite end of the spectrum, which was the Looney Tunes Studios, um, uh, Merry Melodies, uh, all the stuff done by Warner Brothers. Uh, they did some of the funniest shorts, of, in my opinion, of all time. And there are mm. some amazing uh, shorts by Bugs, um, some amazing animation directors. Um, you know, people like Chuck Jones, who just really went to town with, um, you know, not nearly the kind of budget from uh, what Disney did with their movies, but invented new ways to present animation smart, efficiently uh, in the drawn medium and make you laugh on so many levels. And a lot of these were definitely not meant for kids. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that's definitely one of my favorites. I still watch them all the time and they're still insp- inspiring me daily. They're, they're amazing. The posing, the appeal, everything about them is, holds the test of time. It's worth watching. Yeah, you bet. All right. And now we're going to flash forward a little bit in time. And, and this is not to slight anything that was made in that time period, but Lion King, you have to talk about simply because it was not only a good, solid animated story, um, but it was at the time, literally the most successful hand-drawn animated feature made. Now, we can't say it was purely hand-drawn because there are elements of uh, Lion King that use 3D technology back in its infancy, uh, but it's hidden and it's done pretty well uh, in the shots that they use it. But for the most part, uh, 95% of this movie was hand-drawn. And from an artist perspective, I remember uh, the bonuses, um, the year that I came in, I was wishing I was working at the studio because the bonuses were just flying out of the, the trees uh, for artists, um, you know, and um, we just thought that was really special. Oh, and flash forward, we're going from Lion King to Klaus. Klaus not only represents the uh, old, amazing part of hand-drawn animation, but elevates the art form and starts bringing in some new things. And that's why we talk mm-hmm. about Klaus because it definitely represents a benchmark for uh, where we are with hand-drawn animation now, and it's pretty spectacular. So, yeah, it's beautiful. You definitely yeah. should watch it. And the Lion King was the kind of golden pinnacle uh, 2D animation, and then 3D came in, which we're going to look at next. And I'm glad that Claus has uh, brought it back to the forefront. So I hope there's more more 2D animation to come. Yeah, you bet. All right, let's move to 3D animation. Let's talk a little bit about the benchmarks for 3D animation, and uh, you know. This film really was sort of the linchpin for 3D animation as we know it, it at the um, uh, feature film level. Um, yeah. You know, and this was one of those films that um, Phil Tippett at the time, who had done work on Empire Strikes Back, was being looked at to do stop motion for this film, if you can believe that, that they were going to do stop motion for Jurassic Park in 1993. They did some tests at Industrial Light and Magic and wound up showing Steven Spielberg. And next thing you know, Spielberg is like, yeah, we got to go with these tests. And um, they did some amazing tests, you know, of animation with the T-Rex, you know, as a skeleton. And eventually they started skinning it and they got to these results. And it definitely like wowed me when I was a kid. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm hooked. Dinosaurs. I always loved dinosaurs. I loved them even more after this movie. So anyway, yeah. any thoughts, Jason? <laughs> that was that was the movie. It came out when I was, uh, I think, 13 and it inspired me to get into animation. That was the one that I'm sure many people in, in my age group, that was the film that inspired them to start yeah. a career in animation. Yeah, no, this is it's pretty amazing. Let's move on to a couple of years later because this is sort of twinning it. Now you have Toy Story. Uh, so the difference between Toy Story, which visually is so different than like the stuff you see in Jurassic Park. Well, Toy Story is a full 90 plus minute animated feature, which was, you know, the first time that was ever done. So, you know, uh, and not to mention the story uh, that was written by John Lasseter and company. Um, 
you know, I had an old friend, uh, Perry Farinola, who was one of the story artists on this guy's, they really put their heart and soul into creating, um, you know, something that's universal, you know, a universal story that everyone could relate to. And, um, you know, not to mention that it, um, you know, definitely was a benchmark for, you know, the promise of what 3D animation was and is going to be in the next couple of decades uh, to come. So, I, I w you know, I remember seeing that film when I first got hired. It was literally the summer that I, f I got hired at Disney. And I was like, yeah, that's my future. I'm going to have mm -hmm. to trade a pencil for a mouse. So, yeah. all right. Uh, the next thing that we want to talk about is Lord of the Rings. Now, this is definitely, um, you're starting to get into a very sort of blended and seismic technological jump. Uh, you know, obviously animators were starting to uh, do keyframe performances and starting to really bring a lot of life. And this film is sort of a blend of keyframe animation as well as early developments in bringing in motion capture in the mix. And Jason, I know you have a little bit of experience of managing uh, motion capture as well as enhancing it and improving it or augmenting it. There's a lot of things that um, you just don't get for free um, in motion capture. There are things that you have to plus, but this film definitely set the stage and Gollum in particular definitely is just, uh, especially in the second um, film in the trilogy is just pretty amazing. The work that was done. Um, yeah. Do you have any friends that worked on this? Um, not on the original trilogy, no. Not on the original? Yeah. yeah. Maybe The Hobbit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, it was, it was pretty revolutionary. Yeah. All right. Now we're going to flash forward. And the reason why King Kong makes a list twice, I don't know, it must be that people are obsessed with King Kong. Uh, there's been multiple forays of uh, King Kong movies, both uh, in, in America as well as Japan. Um, but... Uh, you know, the maker of Lord of the Rings, uh, Peter Jackson, decided he wanted to do an homage to uh, the original classic 1933 King Kong, but with current technology. And um, I would say even still now, it's still one of my favorites, um, you know, even with the later ones that have come up after this. Um, just the work that was done, especially the dinosaur battle, is probably one of the best filmmaking moments of all time. And if you've never seen this, I'm going to totally recommend uh, if you're a student of animation, you need to watch this because they might have done some stuff with Andy Serkis with parts of that performance with uh, with uh, King Kong, but there was no mo-capping those dinosaurs that were fighting him, and um, that is just an amazing integration of of mm -hmm. just seamless film choreography, cinematography, uh, design, everything going together to make this whole battle almost operatic. Anyway, I, I love this. Uh, particular scene and sequence in the film, and uh, I think it makes the cut. Uh, a few years later, Tangled. Now, why are we bringing Tangled? Uh, you know, 3D animation's been around. Obviously, uh, Pixar was kicking some major butt for the first decade in 3D animation, and then suddenly, you know, around you know the last few years of um, the first part of the millennium, you know, before 2000, Disney was starting to kind of get its act together. And I can say that because I work for the company, but you know, they were a little lagging. But to me, Tangled kind of represents what we all saw when we were at Disney Animation back when I was drawing was the promise of merging the, pro uh, the, the things that make 3D special, but also bringing in the things that make 2D animation special too. And they found a way to do it. And I know Glenn King uh, helming this movie um, really made it a mandate for the animators mm -hmm. to really pay attention to uh, shape and form design as part of... Um, how animation is done. And prior to this, a lot of animation rigs were maybe, I would dare say a little, still a little stiff, maybe not so expressive. And yeah. I think um, from that point on this film, I think it just became more important to be able to solve both 2D design issues as well as uh, 3D um, performances. And I think uh, this movie is a blend of those. And I think Disney animation is never, um, been better since they've started doing this, you know, in all their films since then. So pretty cool. Yeah, it uh, definitely pushed pushed ahead the the appeal because, like you said, it brought the two D sensibilities to three D rigs. But the other thing that that was really important that happened here uh, at Disney is they really spent a lot of time developing the technology for their cloth and hair, and it came up to another level. So not only was the animation level brought up, but 
all of the other stuff that goes with the character performance was brought up. And that's what made this film, I think, so beautiful and surprising to so many people at the time. Yeah, no, I agree, man. Thank you for pointing out all those additional things. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now we're at the Avengers. I and mean, you can't talk about the history of film uh, in terms of stuff. Now, by this time, film and animation, both at the feature level and the visual effects level, have already started to get very sophisticated. In this case, I think the blending and the seamless blending of these two worlds has just never been better. Uh, literally, my childhood was brought to life uh, with um, these films. Um, anyway, I don't know if you've got any thoughts about the Avengers, but I will definitely say, um, you know, I love these big films yet again. So, yeah, it's awesome. All right. And we're just going to talk a little bit about games real quick um, because you can't talk about, you know, media in terms of uh, what's been happening in the last uh, 40 years without referencing how much of a difference um, games have made to the lives of, you know, millennials and the current generation. Uh, games have literally uh, come probably the furthest visually in terms of technological achievement, uh, visuals, quality, so many things have come uh, and changed within the game industry in a much shorter time frame compared to feature films, uh, both in the animation and also on the visual effects side. So when we look at the spectrum of games and the variety of games, I'm sure I'm gonna be, you know, for every game I've shown up here, there's gonna be a ton of games that are off this list of things that inspired us um but um you know here we go and oh there goes ori and will of the wisp that's one of the titles that you worked on uh so that's awesome to get a chance to talk a little bit about and then of course this is where we are so when you look at the arc of games from pong in 1972 to the last of us in 2020 it's an astounding almost 50 year arc of amazing development um visually mm -hmm. and animation yeah. has played a big part in uh, getting animation uh, to be um, totally integrated into the gameplay experience. And you could talk a little bit about that when we get to uh, your part of the presentation. All right, cool. All right. All right, guys. So we're going to start transitioning into the next segment of our presentation on how the animation industry works. And there's a lot to it. And I doubt we're going to get into every nook and cranny because we only have an hour plus today with you guys. But uh, our goal today is to give you a little bit of a, a sense of the, not only the brief history of animation, different mediums, but hopefully you get a chance to get some information that will help you better follow your dreams. And uh, we're hoping that we can provide um, a little bit more inspiration on that front. Um, let's talk a little bit about the 3D production pipeline. And uh, I'm going to let you take over, Jason, on this front. Yeah, all right. Um, so obviously it starts with the script. Um, you know, that sometimes there's a concept pitch that's even less than a script, but a, the script writer has to come in and that will go through many drafts. And honestly, working in this film industry for so many years, it's usually written up until a month before you're done. So it's never final, final. But that yeah. is the start. That is the first step. And then after that, uh, the storyboard artist will start with basically doing a, a moving comic book of the film. Um, it's not fully animated. It's just like basically reading your old, your old fashioned comic book. Sometimes they do some simple animations in 2D. Um, and around this time, you know, they start doing layout and voice recording uh, kind of concurrently. So layout is actually bringing it into a computer and setting up these environments with the cameras and the characters which aren't animated yet placed where they need to be. Uh, at this time, the the actors are taking the script and working with the director and doing the, the voice recordings, right? Um, and then uh, at the same time, um, the, the, the concept department is doing all the concept art. And, and that art is taken in the modeling and rigging department will start to sculpt sometimes in actual uh, real sculptures and then scan them in or, or sometimes on the computer, um, which is uh, something that CGMA does as well. And the riggers will take those models and put in skeleton underneath. So you can move it around just like those old fashioned stop motion puppets and the animators will be able to take it and make performances. And then we get to the step that we're here to talk about which is animation. And we're gonna break that down in, in more detail coming up. 
but animation is where the performance was about. Once animation finishes, you go down into the, the post animation departments, which are CFX and Sim. CFX is it's cloth simulation. So if the character is wearing clothes or has a long cape or whatever it is, uh, and, and hair, flowing hair, those kind of things. Simulation also can be water, smoke, fire, all sorts of cool stuff that the animators don't do anymore uh, the same way it was done back in the day with 2D drawings. It's done with other types of programs um, and not by moving puppets around. Um, and then effects is part of all this, right? Um, after that, the lighters come in and they have the job of making everything look beautiful. So that's the, the big step when you're seeing the, the process steps of animation. When you see it go from kind of the play blast flat colored to the lighting, that's when most um, people that are uh, kind of new to the industry are like, whoa, that's the biggest difference. That's the, the biggest difference you can see. Um, and, and that's such an important step. And then compositing comes in and composites the background. Sometimes there's you know paintings or, or different layers of, of characters. and makes it all seamless and color corrects it. Um, and they can do 2D effects on top of it if, if need be. Um, and then you get the final output along with like, at this time they're doing the final sound music and like Foley effects, like the sound of people walking or whatever the, the things the characters are doing in the scene that the characters uh, didn't do in the storyboard. If, if I'm animating it, they need to add those sounds. So that's the, the basic kind of, order of things. Obviously, some things are, are moving around uh, as we go, but that's kind of how it goes. Yeah, it's, I, don't, I don't get that the uh, order is uh, firmly in place. I think it's more like a bunch of bricks sort of stacked, and then every once yeah. in a while it goes back over when there are changes, and you got to go back in the loop again. So there's a lot of things happening, uh, but there is a, a an order to the madness of uh, making films, especially animated films, and that kind of has to be um, we always used to say that uh, in animation, we make the film twice, the first time in story and then the second time in production, <laughs> you know, so yeah. and a lot of change can happen in that time period. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Let's let's go ahead and um, and uh, talk a little bit about the modern feature. Since we're talking about animation, uh, we thought I thought it would be a good uh, opportunity for you to uh, share, you know, talk a little bit about the modern feature animation pipeline through uh, Tangled. So yeah, this is this is uh, kind of the breakdown steps of uh, an animation, and this is the final version of it in the film, um, uh, which is which is kind of nice to see from like a, a zoomed out perspective, and we, we have a zoomed in perspective of the actual animation process after. But here you can see it starts with the layout of the shot. So here they have the the rigs, which are not animated yet placed in the scene in the correct position based on the storyboards. The camera, which is animated and moving by the cinematographer in the layout department. Um, in this particular sequence, obviously the background is very dark, so you don't see a lot of it. It's a musical sequence. And if you scrub ahead a little bit, um, you know, you can see the, the rough planning by the animator. Now, not all animators will do planning with drawings, but a lot that have the ability do. And after or concurrently, the animator will do video reference, as you can see here, which can be very helpful. Uh, I do it all the time, especially when you're doing humanoid characters. Uh, it helps you, it's not mo motion capture, it's different than motion capture, it's more of like an example for ideas. So if you think about like, if you're drawing a figure, light and life drawing, it's not a photograph, it's an inspiration. And as an animator, you can take that pose and push it in different ways. So here you see um, his blocking pass, which is, uh, setting the keyframes of the poses to tell the story. And this will be shown to the lead supervisors, directors, to make sure he's going down the right path. And then after this, let's scrub ahead a bit. Uh, okay. There you go. Uh, I think this is still blocking. And then, okay, after that, you have the spline process. And here you can see he actually did a 2D drawing of what he wants, hopefully, the, the hair sim to look like on the little push and the spin. So here now it's animating at 24 frames per second, and the, the arcs and the timing is being worked out much smoother. This is like an in-progress. And then after that, you have the, the final passes where he's working on polishing that shot and making it look really perfect. 
Oh, uh, this is, I just wanted to show what it looked like with the hair. <laughs> There's a lot that goes into the hair effects, uh, literally brought on very, very uh, mm -hmm. smart and, and the, the handle. And the cloth. <laughs> so that helps uh, quite a bit with supporting the animation performance for sure. Um, there you have the uh, lighting. And there goes the final, yeah, looks awesome, beautiful. Cool. It's always exciting to see that as an animator, wait a few months after, and then you're like, oh, look at it, it looks so cool. Cool. All right. Let's go and move to the next part of our presentation, which are animation job types. So, Jason, tell us a little bit about this. You've been in the industry for quite a bit of time, and you've got an understanding of um, animation in all these three different areas. I'm just going to go ahead and pull them all up for you to kind of take a look at and talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been fortunate to have worked in video games, visual effects, and feature film, and I have worked uh, in pretty much all of these positions. Um, so uh, obviously, uh, you start in the animation industry if you're working in feature at, uh, as a junior animator, which is what, which is what I did. I actually started in games, um, and then I went into feature. And then um, usually you'll move up and to being a senior eventually, and then a lead, and sometimes a supervisor. Um, and you can see that in feature film um, that they have, they have all these different jobs concurrently in, in VFX as well. The only thing that obviously we don't see is the gameplay animator. That's something that doesn't happen in feature and VFX. And in games, they do sometimes have leads and supervisors, but it, in the studios I've worked, it tends to be kind of more of a, a flat hierarchy. Um, so you, you are all just kind of working in the same goal. Um, in games, you do have, uh, and VFX, you have mocap cleanup animators, which is where you take this mocap data, depending on the type of game, because obviously Jack and Daxter and Ori, we didn't do any mocap. Um, but on Uncharted, for example, and Last of Us, there's a lot of mocap done. And in VFX films, uh, like Iron Man and, and things like that, um, mocap is used. Um, so uh, with, that, with that job, it's, it's kind of pushing the pose, doing the hands and the face, and um, and basically like making the performance work for the character model you have and not just look like a guy on a stage with a spandex. <laughs> but there's quite a, quite a few different jobs as you can see in the animation uh, category. Cool, terrific. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, visual effects uh, animation and animation uh, that is done on the Avengers is a good example, especially on the Hulk. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this full screen for you guys. Just the expression that changes as you're looking at somebody is going to be is going to read very differently and that's where animators really come into play is working with the sensitivities of the facial expressions and the performance that's been given but being able to adapt it to fit the character that they're going to need so that the audience can understand what the actor was bringing to bear but really feeling it in the in the character in some cases where the hulk needs to jump or fight aliens or do something very physical that's where uh, keyframe animation takes over. If it's something that's a little more subtle or uh, he's acting against Captain America or Thor, that's something where we can definitely use uh, March performance as a basis and then kind of uh, push and manipulate that from there. So that could be a marriage of um, keyframe animation and what we capture on set with Mark, or it could be an entirely Mark performance. And we're back. <laughs> All right. Well, Jason, you've got some VFX animation experience, and um, talk a little bit about your experience on Iron Man. Yeah, I mean, Iron Man was uh, I was on it for like four or five months at DNEG in London, and um, it was supposed to be all mocap because we had a mocap performer do all these stunts, but in the end, it didn't work. It just felt like too lights and didn't have the, the energy. We needed so it ended up being almost 99% keyframe. There was a couple shots where they used a little bit of mocap for a few things, um, and even the simplest things like that first shot of him turning his head. You know, the the the, the mocap actor had just kind of turned normally, and we were like, "Well, that doesn't look cool." So all I did was slow it down so his head came at the end, and it made it look much more heroic, right? So it was a fun fun project, and uh, I got to do my first Marvel movie. 
Oh, that's excellent. No, I'm a big fan already. And um, obviously did some work on After Earth and uh, yeah. Paul uh, as well. Yeah, those are those were different uh, projects, but also uh, very good learning experiences having to do, you know, animals and study animal animation and realistic type of ways. And Paul was essentially, you know, Seth Rogen's character um, as an alien. So he was you could just act act out uh, fun performances with him. It was it was actually much more similar to working in feature film. Uh, Paul. So it was a very unique VFX experience. That's cool. Well, let's also move on then to um, your uh, games experience, actually. Um, I know that uh, you've gotten a chance to both work on both uh, gameplay stuff as well as, um, uh, you know, cinematics. And maybe you can talk a little bit about the difference between uh, the two uh, things, uh, uh, two types of jobs, and um, maybe the mindset that you need to have uh, to approach each of them. And do you want to, uh, which one do you want to start talking about first, Gears of War or a gameplay? What would you like to talk about? Uh, we can start with Gears of War. Um, I worked on that uh, in 2015. It was a remake. And I was uh, in charge of the Instead of redoing the whole cinematics of the first game, because um, it was essentially we had to re-storyboard out, which I got to be, I think I spent a month and a half redoing uh, the storyboards, which was fun. I got to draw. And then they took took those storyboards to the set um, and recorded the actors, the new actors doing the mocap for them. Um, and then we got to animate the cutscenes. So we got to set up the cameras and and plus the performances. So there was some cases of keyframe, like you see when he's jumping away from you know, doing stunts essentially. Uh, but most of this was pretty much the the performances uh, with us doing the hands and the faces on top of it. So it was a, it was a layered uh, process and um, it ended up being uh, very, very successful and, and worked really well. And they continued, they did a bunch of Gears games after this. This was kind of the prototype for the new generation of Gears games. Cool, excellent. Cool. Let's talk a little bit about um, Ori gameplay, because that's also got uh, that's a little bit a few years later and also um, some different things to think about. Let me go ahead and get it started for you. So gameplay, I first was my first job. I worked in 2002 doing doing uh, Jack and Baxter 2. And essentially it's lots of cycles. So it has to work from different camera angles. Uh, Ori is a little bit of an exception because it is a 2D side scroller, so you can graphically position things to work to, to camera. But usually when you're doing game cycles, um, they need to work from all angles. So you have to actually make sure you're not cheating things. Um, and it's really important to have a good sense of weight and arcs and timing. Um, but but yeah, we, we, were, um, we were really lucky at Ori because we got to push the animation style to be a little bit more exaggerated than um, say Gears of War. As Ori himself is this little spirit elf, you know, and he's got tons of squash and stretch and all sorts of cool moves that he does. Um, so that whole world was a joy to be working on. And you can see here, it's just a lot of sort of the development process, the play blast. This is how it looked when we were working on it with these cards as backgrounds and everything not lit. The final game obviously was far more beautiful with all the lighting and colors put in. Cool, terrific. And uh, I guess uh, you want to talk a little bit about Ori cinematics, or is, uh, uh, did you have any? Because I know that they're they're just gorgeous. I mean, you know. Well, here, yeah, here here you can see what the kind of final game looks like. Um, the the lighting and, and painting, and it's beautiful. But the the artists at Moon Studios are some of the best in the world. And um, and this this process was essentially much more like feature film because we were doing the camera timing. And we were keyframing everything to to do acting performances. So there wasn't really any video reference or mocap in any way. This was just purely using animation techniques and skills to create a believable performance on these fun characters. And um, it was a great great process because, as you can see, if you've ever played Ori, it's, it's there's not a lot of dialogue. And most feature film, when I do work on it. It's a lot of talking back and forth, back and forth. So it's really nice to do some fun kind of Miyazaki style pantomime type acting. And I had a great, great time working on this project. It was a great learning experience and a joy to be part of. That's cool, man. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate it. Some great stuff. 
All right, and finally, let's talk a little bit about your extensive um, feature animation experience. And uh, I know that um, this one in particular, when I was going through your feature, you know, YouTube um, channel that you have there, this one, I love just to see what you were doing with the acting and how it was translated. Maybe you could speak a little bit about, um, you know, just your process. Um, and uh, I'll go ahead and start it for everyone. Yeah, so this is a, a good example of a breakdown of my process. Um, I have a lot of these on my website, but this one in particular shows the storyboards, which I didn't do these, I think it's Chris Byrne. But these four storyboards in particular were beautifully done. And I remember when I saw the shot, I was begging the, the supervisor to give me that shot. And of course, everyone was. I was fortunate enough to uh, win the lottery of that shot and then um, got to do uh, the video reference with it. We all had obtained a little berry doll, which I've lost somehow. Um, and uh, my, uh, my girlfriend acted out the strawberry there. And, and, and you can see um, there was some things I found in the video reference that I would never have thought of. Like when I turned my head there, there's kind of this little double hitch. And those are the beautiful things that happen naturally when you do video reference that I wouldn't have thought of if I just animated it from scratch. And on the bottom left is, is sort of the in-process blocking pro uh, step. And the bottom right is the final shot. Um, and all Barry a, wants is, is hugs. I got a question for you um, just on your process. I noticed that um, a lot of animators use this. Um, they use the step method for um, animating in Maya prior to spline. Is that uh, the rule for a lot of animators? Or is that like just depends on personal preference on that front? It's personal preference. I would say most the feature film studios I work at, two thirds to three quarters of the animators do that method because it's easier to show your idea quicker. Um, but there is quite a few people that uh, work in the layered method, which is another technique where you just keep the movement always smooth and keep building more detail on top of it. And I think depending on the type of shot you're animating, the layered method can actually work really well if you're doing um, a subtle animation of like the shoulders and head, just kind of little movements and shrugs because it's very difficult with step keys to show subtle things happening. Uh, yeah. The more you exaggerate movement, the crazier the poses and action-y, I think the more useful it is to do stepped keys. In my opinion. Yeah, I think that to me is the biggest contribution that 3D animation at the feature level has been in terms of uh, what I call the, the subtlety of, you know, being close to the uh, face and just noticing small things. It was something that was really, really difficult to do with hand-on animation to get that level of subtlety, you know, in the eye pupil shifts and uh, just subtle gestures that happen all the time, but because of the nature of drawings, sometimes it's, it's really hard to build that in. So I think 3D just really opened that part of the process up. So it's, it's just lovely to see. Let's uh, keep going. Um, all right, so we're going to talk a little bit about skills to master to become an animator. Um, and, uh, you know, there's plenty of them, um, you know, to, to master. Just when I was learning, um, it was enough to just know how to draw well. <laughs> Never mind when you get there and you're like, oh, wait a minute, I got to learn about acting too. And then I got to learn about design. And then I got to learn about physics. I mean, there's a lot to learn in, in becoming an animator. Holy smokes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's that's the, the 12 principles that you will learn at any animation school or if you study it online. Um, and this is where you start when, when you go and you start with squash and stretch, anticipation, staging. And these are all uh, steps that you will learn um, here at CGMA when you, when you sign up. Um, now I'm going to do a little bit of animation analysis on a few films um, discussing a few of those principles just to give you an idea of some of the things. So one of the most important principles is uh, the bouncing ball, which is also uh, squash and stretch uh, related. Um, and the bouncing ball is taught as, for animators to learn like how to exaggerate things. So if you have you know, a tennis ball that's bouncing, it has a certain cadence. You know, It goes down quickly, bounces off the ground, goes into what we call hang time. So it slows down because it's going away from gravity and then it accelerates back towards ground. So there's a, a timing change on this bouncing ball it's not even, it goes fast, slow, fast, slow, right? And in animation, we like to exaggerate these things. Now, depending on the weight of a character, it can move very differently. So here we have 
the lightest character you could possibly see. It's a flea. So it's his name is P.T. Flea, uh, and his accents are all just bouncing balls. And you can see I've drawn over here, as you can see, the, the timing of this bouncing ball is quite quick. He just bounces off the ground like a popcorn kernel. He doesn't dwell a lot of time. He doesn't have a lot of anticipation, which we'll talk about in a minute, to get going. And when he does hit the ground, he doesn't have a lot of weight. He just sort of sticks. So this is really important uh, to see when you're trying to show something that doesn't have a lot of weight. So this is a very light bouncing ball, but he's still following the animation principles of the bouncing ball, which is fast, slow, fast, right? And Speaking of anticipation, we're going to look at a clip from Tangled. So here's a clip of uh, Anna singing. And basically in here, what I've highlighted is a few poses. So here we have a pose A, right? And we go into what's called an anticipation. So in this case, it's usually an opposite action before an action. So the, the most clear anticipation would be, say, uh, um, if you're going to throw a ball, you have to bring your arm back before you throw it forward, right? Um, but we do anticipation and animation all, all sorts of times. If a character is going to reach into his pocket, you might just reach into your pocket, but Mickey Mouse will go like this, which is an anticipation, and then reach into his pocket. So as the viewer, you know what he's going to do, and that way you don't miss it. So here, she's going to do something really cool, and as you can see, whew, that's the change, right? There's the, the pose of the action. And these movements here are all in between where you follow nice arcs and, and lines of action. Here's another example. Here you have pose A, which is her acting pose. And then she has her big anticipation here, which is a very strong anticipation for her forward Adukin action. Um, another thing of principle to mention in animation is line of action. And here's a very strong example from Tangled. Glenn Keane has his hands all over this. You can see how strong you have this thrust through her character, right? Just these beautiful curves and straights. Compared to him, he's all bunched up in the opposite of her, right? Um, and then when she does release here, you can see it all collapse. So love, this, love wouldn't been, shape. <laughs> yeah, this wouldn't have been as strong if he didn't have such great lines of action. That's like perfect example of 2D shapes being thrown in 3D. Yep. Uh, another principle here, a very important principle in animation is overlapping action, secondary action and follow through. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a ponytail or a cloak, because it can mean a lot of things inanimate and inanimate. In this case, it's, it's something that a character has control over. So here's a scene from Bolt where uh, this this guy gets thrown, uh, electrocuted and thrown off his bike. And the primary action is driving from his core here. But if you watch what I've drawn and highlighted, you can see you have this arm that is following, delayed his movement, right? And this is what we call overlapping action and the breaking of joints. So you can see here, this arm is coming up and then as it starts to go down, the joints break because what's happening is this part's going down, but this part's still going up. This is a really important animation principle that you have to master to create believable movement. So you can see this arm is following all these principles and then he flies off screen. And this, this shot's the same thing. It's another example of this. Now in here, it's a little different because he's actually using his arm. It's not kind of like a rag doll to move his body, but it's moving either in advance or behind of his center of mass. And it's creating him counterbalance and basically forward momentum where he needs to go. As you can see, you frame through it, it's all timed differently from his center. He uses it to throw himself up forward. Another animation principle uh, that's important is, is posing, um, appeal. And this is a clip from uh, Toy Story um, where Woody is basically introduced. 
it's high degree of personality. It's done by Doug Sweetland, who is an amazing director and animator from Pixar, one of the superstars of our 3D era. I was lucky to work with him on Storks. And I just want to point out a few things from this shot. Obviously, you have really good asymmetrical appealing poses. And Woody has this great cocky walk with the hip swing, right? So you can see like these, these shifts in weight, which are so important and sh showing such really, really great attitude, right? The other thing that he does here, and it kind of goes back to the bouncing ball, is he decides to direct your eye where to look. And one of the ways you do that is you do actions that are important during what we call hang time. So here, you know, if he's very still and he does this little movement, you're going to catch that movement because there's nothing else moving here to distract you. And then he starts this great walk. And as he's going into his hang time, because here's the weight shift, you can see his whole body's moving down, right? Now he's going into his hang time. And here, if you watch this pose, it's not moving very much. He's up in the air, moving slowly, almost a held pose. The only thing that moves is here. So you catch that. Right? You can't miss it. And that's what he wants you to see. That's the personality flip. Then boom, the body moves again. And then you go, nice hang time. Boom, the little nose character bit. Then weight hits, the whole body moves. And that is how you create um, appeal in an animation. You have, you have to direct the eye to the important parts and add personality when you know the audience won't miss it. Uh, last year, we're gonna look at, you know, the classic that we all love, King Kong. And now we're going back to the bouncing ball here. And, and I, this is actually not the bouncing ball. This is what I call the bowling ball because King Kong is massive. And if you drop a bowling ball, it's not gonna bounce much. It's gonna hit the ground. It might bounce a little if it's on concrete because it's such a rigid thing. But if you drop it on, a, on grass, it's not gonna bounce, right? If it's on a hill, it will eventually start to roll. Um, so it takes its time because it's got such uh, inertia of its own that to change directions, it takes a lot of effort. And if you essentially watch this clip, imagining that King Kong and the T-Rexes are giant bowling balls, you'll start to understand what it is that animators have to do to create heavy, believable characters. So let me finish this out and then I'll go back and show you a few things. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So much weight. Oh my God. You feel the power and the, the magnificence of these characters. So, you know, he's, he's essentially a bowling ball with arms and he has these strong limbs that can propel him through these things. Uh, so here you see him pushing this weight forward and then dropping it down. And it, when it hits the ground, it, it stays there. It just has to readjust its rotation and torque to move again to get the, the T-Rex to fly over him. Uh, here we're looking at the T-Rex's body, right? Lifting that heavy bowling ball up and over. And then this one is the the, the heavy rock. It's essentially just a bowling ball smashing down. And as you see it hit the ground, it just smashes like a bowling ball was and slowly falls over, right? Here, King Kong and the T-Rex, think of them as bowling balls with these limbs. And as long as the bowling ball is moving in a very slow, controlled way, you're gonna have weight. You can do anything you want with these extra limbs. If you start to accelerate that bowling ball, change directions quickly, or have it move fast, move slow, move fast, you're gonna lose all sense of weight. And all these clips we're looking at, they do not break that rule. That bowling ball is solid. It takes a while to get moving. It takes a while to stop. And when it starts going in a direction, it continues it until there's a good reason to stop, like the solid ground here. And then it will just start to roll as the, the limbs, limbs kick, right? So there we have smash on the ground, his limbs will overlap. The bowling ball stays put right there. Um, this is a really great example from the side view. You can see King Kong picking up the T-Rex and throwing him over. Squashes on the ground 
and then flips up into the air, down. Now, when he hits the ground here, it smashes and sticks because its momentum was going down and then slowly rotates as his legs and tail squirms downward, downward, downwards, off screen. Same exact thing here at the end. You have this T-Rex fighting for his life, pulling away. King Kong grabs back. T-Rex pulls again. King Kong gives a mighty last effort and pulls him down. Squash bounces just the tiniest bit here. You see that a bouncing ball would go way up. This one is a bowling ball. It barely goes up. It falls, smashes on the ground, again, sticks, and slowly starts to roll as he squirms. So these animators really understood the principles of animation to create this stuff in such a beautiful way. Jason, that was such a cool presentation that you just gave us. Um, so grateful that you are sharing your amazing wisdom about things that are actually going to be relevant in the next part of this presentation. So for you attendees that are um, a part of this, uh, we just wanted to make an announcement and just let you know that if you stick to the end of this webinar, you'll get a chance to learn about something cool and special from CGMA, uh, who decided to release a free animation course. When we started CGMA, we wanted to provide you with the best online education from the best artists in the world and the skills needed to kickstart your career at an affordable price. We decided to give back to community, to people who want to start a career in animation, but didn't know where to start or even if they would like animation. So we created Animation for Beginners course completely free uh, with a $50 registration fee, which will be applied to your program if you continue your education at CGMA. If you're just starting in animation, this four week course is perfect start to your career. So let me tell you a little bit about Animation for Beginners. And there's some cool things included in this four week program. Uh, this class was created by Todd Elliott, and he's a 25 year animation veteran. From animating a bouncing ball to transforming that ball into a character, you can see what the animation process is like. This exciting new class gives you a chance as a beginner to learn a little bit more about some basic animation principles while learning Maya to see if 3D animation as a profession is for you. What's included in this four week program? Well, here's some details about the class. So you're going to get an introduction to Maya itself, the timeline. You'll learn about keyframes and the graph editor. So you'll also learn about basic translation controls of the ball rig. Uh, you'll learn how to set keyframes. You'll learn some bonus content for those who want a little bit of extra information. Um, and you'll start getting into ease-ins and ease-outs and breaking tangents. So in week two, all right, it's a continuation of doing things like ease-ins and ease-outs breaking of tangents, you'll be moving the ball along a path, and you'll be starting uh, to get an introduction to arcs. Uh, you'll be copying and modifying curves. Uh, you'll be breaking up the cycle and varying and reducing the height of bounces. You'll also get some additional controls in the ball rig to uh, get some squash and stretch in the actual ball. Now, week three, you're going to get a chance to uh, interact with the set. And then you're going to also make the ball to come to a stop. And you're going to get a chance to demonstrate the difference between a bounce and a jump. Okay. And you'll also get an introduction to anticipation, which Jason talked about in the presentation. Um, and that will be setting up um, the rest of the animation. And then a bonus content for that is you start, for some of you, you, get, you guys may uh, want to start dealing with the full ball rig, which is, you know, showing some ears, some whiskers, some eyes, and maybe start lightly introducing secondary action and follow through. Now, week four, uh, you'd be continuing with secondary action and follow through, and then you just start kind of dealing with uh, subtle things like blinks and look direction for the character and all sorts of polish uh, on trying to sweeten up um, the scene, and then you'll get a quick demonstration on how to render. All right, guys, so for those of you who need some accountability or extra help with a community of people pushing for the same target, well, we want to introduce the student community on our Unity platform. Uh, you'll get class materials and projects, 
and you'll be able to develop um, relationships with your online peers. You're also going to have access to the most important thing, which are industry pros to help you succeed via live Q&A and feedback for your individual projects that you do on the course. So all these things are going to be there for you. Uh, and we do this with all our classes that we have at CGMA. So for those of you interested in animation for beginners, all it takes is one small, simple payment for your registration fee. To get started, uh, definitely go to www.cgmasteracademy.com for more info. So to get started in our Q&A, um, Charles Edward um, asked, what are the top things a junior animator or a junior effects artist should put in their demo reel? Jason. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you need to be a good animator to get an animation job. So obviously, um, you want to have your best work first. Uh, it should show a combination of good weight, full body mechanics, not just the character from the you know chest up doing some gestures. Um, ideally, you have character interaction with either objects in the environment or other characters. Um, your demo reel as a junior animator should be more than 30 seconds, but probably less than a minute because nobody's expecting you to have a lot of content. They're just looking for the potential. And you want to, if you're going to work in feature film, you want to have some acting stuff. So you want to have some dialogue and some characters talking and performing. Uh, if you're going to be working in VFX or games, you want to make sure you have lots of body mechanics stuff. So cool stunts or, uh, you know, heavy preacher type stuff or uh, animals running around, uh, characters using weapons, that kind of stuff. You can see good examples of demo reels all over the Internet, uh, but those are some of the basic rules. Try to avoid, you know, anything that might be offensive uh, with profanity in your dialogue and, and things like that that are too political. And um, try to have, if you're going to use audio, clips, um, try to have it so it's something that people can understand the first time they hear it. Um, uh, one little tip I like to give to my animators is try to find an audio clip for your demo reel where there is stutters or pauses or some sort of mess up. Because if you notice in most films, there's none of that because people are reading off a line and they're just saying their lines and it's perfect. But in real life, there's tons of that. People always stop and go, uh, uh, um, cough sigh and when you can add those into your performance suddenly it seems much more believable so that's just a little tip to try so in other words we want the mistakes there we want the exactly. uh, human affectations oh, they're nice <laughs> they're nice to have sometimes if you can yes. find it. yeah definitely cool all right let's see what the uh next attendee uh wrote in about okay this is delia jernigan and she asked <laughs> how late is too late to start learning animation wow <laughs> well, one of my students uh, about 10 years ago was in her 60s and she was just learning animation for the first time. So I would say it's never too late. Um, a lot of my friends and peers in the industry started this career late because they started a new they, they started a new career essentially. So they were in their in their 30s or 40s when they wanted to go into animation. So I mean, I suppose if you don't want to work and you're retired, maybe that's too late, but maybe you're doing it as a hobby. Um, I don't think there is any any uh, certain date that applies to anybody. Um, so if you're following your dreams, you're doing the right thing. That's cool. Excellent. All right. Now, Christopher Fenton asks, what keeps you going when you're feeling burnt out? Or do you ever feel burnt out? And how uh, do you recognize it and overcome it? I think every animator is going to feel burnt out. Um, the hardest I ever worked was in college when I was you know, 19, 20 years old. Um, I worked more hours than I ever did as a professional because you're working for yourself. Uh, and obviously having the youth, you didn't get as tired and you know, we're running on coffee. But when you're getting paid to do work, you're expected to do it at a certain level. And if you do burn the midnight oil too much, even if you're getting paid overtime, you know, one thing you want to try to avoid in the industry is, is ghost hours. It's a common problem where you work more hours and don't bill it, but it happens a lot. And it's a bad problem because then you have a, a unrealistic image of, of your performance and the studio isn't paying you fairly. So really try to avoid ghost hours. But one thing you should do is try to work the 
eight hour days and get your work done in it. Because what happens is over the course of a year, when you're working day after day on a project, you have only so much creative energy to give. Animation is very demanding. It's a very um, fun job. It's got a lot of variety. You're learning all the time. But if you're working 12 hour days for an extended period of time or more, you're going to lose that edge and that creative spirit. And then your work suffers. So there's a balance. It's okay to work, um, you know, a lot of overtime for a month or two here and there. But you should really try to minimize the hours and increase your efficiency. And that way you get time out of work to do all the other important things you need in life, like exercise and sleep. It's <laughs> hmm. a good point. Um, I remember Mulan the last six months, definitely my drawing counts definitely dropped as we went mm -hmm. later and later into the evening. Uh, so uh, definitely we probably should have taken your advice uh, back then on that project for sure. Uh, yeah, I guess to, to recognize to recognize yeah. it, if, if you're dreaming about work, yeah. you're probably working too hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's Yes, we were dream, dreaming about work for sure. Or nightmares, depending on your point of view. So, you know. <laughs> yes, either way. <laughs> All right, so what's the next question? Okay, Sophie Gass, um, she asks, what are good reference books that help with gesture drawing and the 12 principles of animation. All right, well, I'm prepared for this question. Um, this is one of the classics. We have the Richard Williams Animator Survival Guide, um, which is highly recommended. I've had this since uh, I was in school. Uh, this is another good one. Lots of great drawings in here, the Animator's Workbook. Cool. Uh, Preston Blair has a great one called The Art of Animation, which I have somewhere. Um, and then, of course, the Bible, of animation is this one, which is quite a hefty book. Oh yeah. But it's it's been around for uh I don't know four or five decades or something, and it's got so much great information in here that still stands the test of time. There's maybe 20% of this book that's not going to be as applicable with current 3D animation, like the multi-plane camera stuff. Yeah. Uh, as far as drawing, um, I have a few, um, there's a lot of great drawing books out there. One of the best things to do is just go out to a life drawing course and draw. Uh, what, what should we said is drawing is not essential to be a good animator. It, it's a, it's an, a good aid. It helps you be an animator. It helps you get your ideas across faster. Unless, of course, you're a 2D animator, then yes, you have to be a great artist. Mm -hmm. um, this is a great one from a friend of mine and my classmate in school, um, from uh, Samantha Youssef. And, it's a book called Movement and Form. And she's working on a sequel now uh, that sounds really interesting. She's amazing. And this is uh, another great one I have. This is one of two books drawn to yeah. life. And it's by a uh, legend, uh, life drawing teacher from Disney, Walt Stanfield. So I've been to some classes of people that took his classes and taught his method. And they were very helpful for gesture drawing. Yeah, so they were we, yeah, we used to... We used to circle, circulate those drawings all the time at the studio. So great, great choices. Thank you. Uh, Miko Zuck, all right. Do you think the game industry is easier to get to as an animator compared to animated feature film industry? I guess he's wondering if it's harder to get into games or easier to get into games compared to feature. <laughs> uh, in general, I would say yes. Uh, the the competition level is higher in feature film and uh, maybe even VFX than, than games. Um, I think the, the hardest job to get is the feature film animator, um, probably, and TV would be maybe the easiest. Um, uh, some game animation companies, uh, if, you're, if they're doing mocap, um, they just want to make sure you can clean up mocap, which is not as, as challenging as, as some of the other stuff. But there are several game studios that you have to be very, very good to get into. So I'm not going to generalize too much um, because uh, I'm sure there's some game studios that are harder to get into than lots of feature film studios. Cool. Sarai Williams is uh, asking the question, would taking the course, uh, the she's talking about the Animation for Beginners course, would be overwhelming if you're also going to college in the fall? Hmm, that's a good question. Yeah, I think this is a question that a lot of students ask me, and, and I've taught students uh, for many years. Uh, I've been teaching for almost 15 years, and I've had students that are full-time employed uh, with another job. You know, maybe they're an engineer or whatever, um, and students that are going to college for their business degree or whatever it is, well, they're taking animation. 
and also students that are completely focused on their animation course. Now, it's a very time consuming learning how to animate because you have to learn by doing lots of mistakes. So if you're very serious about animation, I would say it's going to be difficult to do both. And my recommendation is to focus on something like CGMA and make that the college you're going to. Cool. And I think we might be at the end of our questions. All right. Well, yeah. it, was a, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet, Jason. Thank you so much for just, you know, taking the time. And uh, we, we, we're we so grateful to have you, Jason, your multi-level experience in the industry. Uh, we are so grateful for your wisdom, your experience, your enthusiasm. Uh, all of that is just amazing. Uh, we thank all the attendees who have seen this um, webinar or will see it in the future are definitely going to be lucky to have gotten the benefit of your uh, wisdom. I just want to say on behalf of CGMA and the Animation Masters Academy, uh, I want to thank our audience for taking the time out of their lives to investigate whether or not animation and pursuing a career in it is for them. Uh, we hope that you guys take advantage of going to our website. And if you have any curiosity at all in enrolling in animation for beginners, please avail yourself of this opportunity. Uh, there aren't many like this um, in online learning. And we are really proud of this class, and we think it's going to move the needle for a lot of people um, in terms of what they want to do uh, with their features. So on behalf of CGMA, I want to say uh, my name is Frank Cordero. Thank you very much for participating, and we're so grateful to have you guys here. Signing off.